So my first question is, what is acting? Well, I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, phrase because it, it implies, uh, to some extent, not being what you look like or what you seem to be. When someone says, for example, I was only acting, um, there is an, an, an implication that it involves pretense. And of course the theatre is in fact uh, the, the, uh, the, the exemplification of that business of pretense. When an audience like ladies and gentlemen seated here are, are sitting looking that way into the, in, in, onto the stage, they are actually uh, sustaining a double vision. They are seeing at once someone who they know to be, say, Sir Laurence Olivier or whoever, uh, and in fact they've, in, in some cases they paid a lot of money in order to see someone actual who is not acting being Sir Laurence Olivier but at the same time they are also sustaining a double vision of seeing someone who doesn't exist at all Othello in fact uh, Bernard Williams, a philosopher epitomized this by a phrase which he uh, wrote and he said uh, I'm sitting in the third row of the uh, the old Vic, and I am 18 feet from Sir Laurence Olivier. How many feet am I from Othello? <laughs> well, there is, of course, this double vision which the, um, the, which the audience sustains because they are simultaneously appreciating someone who they know to be an actual person, who, when he goes off stage, is no longer Othello, but is in fact Sir Laurence Olivier, and someone who, in fact, doesn't exist either on stage or off stage because he is being pretended to be that person and he is or she is acting being someone so that acting and pretense are part and parcel of the same um, enterprise and that actually relates also to what goes on with pictures. Pictures are in fact representations of rather than actually being what they seem to be representations of. We know them to be representations, we never confuse them, we don't try to go through um, a picture which represents a distant scene um, and feel in fact that it affords us a progress through it um, any more than a reflection does, which is also a... But of course it, it's interesting if you look at films, that the first films that were shown, I think a train coming into a station in Paris, the audience ran for the exit. Yes, but because there was, they had not yet acquainted themselves mm. with the extent to which what in fact was represented is in fact something uh, other than a representation, that it is in fact actual. Mm. Um, and of course very rapid approaches of things when they're moving uh, I don't think that anyone was actually convinced that something was going to attack them, but nevertheless they were appalled by something which seemed to make a rapid and possibly lethal approach to them. And they were unable to make a sharp distinction between the extent to which that was a pretended thing and wasn't in fact what it was seemed to be of, but was something that it actually was. And this, in almost all the arts, the visual arts and the dramatic arts, whether it's operatic or whether it's theatrical, are in fact something where the audience sustains this double vision and is amusing themselves by um, actually valuing what they know to be an actual person who when he goes off stage goes to his home, is alive still, having just played someone who doesn't go off stage at all. A fellow never goes off stage, um, Olivier goes off stage and then at the end of the show takes a bow and he takes a bow as Sir Laurence Olivier, not as Othello. He doesn't, as it were, make like a generous gesture and say, I'd now like to introduce Othello because I am actually, I have just been Othello or yeah, I'm pretending. For the actor, this strikes me as, in a way, a wonderful thing because I remember Ian McKellen saying once uh, that if you're acting in the theatre, lucky enough to have a job, for two and a half hours every evening, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think we all know uh, who we are. Um, I think that p p people can often ask questions and say, who do you think you are? Then, then hence the name of that famous <coughs> television program, who do you think you are, um, is in some way uh, dependent upon who you think you are descended from and so on and so forth, that your ancestry and your ethnicity to some extent determines, or for some people, determines who you are. F for me, 
that means very little. I suppose I have some sort of relationship to my late father and mother, um, but not much further back than that. Uh, I don't, I don't feel any sort of ethnic identification with the fact that I am, as it were, Jewish. I'm not, as it were, as I said in the program when I did Beyond the Fringe, when someone <laughs> Alan Bailey to me and said, you're, you're Jonathan Miller's a Jew. And I said, well, I'm just Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and my father was livid about that. <laughs> I just thought I wasn't honouring my ancestry. Can I, as a director, because you've been an actor and you very much... I've only you? acted once in my life. Okay, but mm. that was fairly famous. It was, it was... Um, it was Wait a minute, you played show. in One Way Pendulum as well. Oh yes, I did, very briefly. Oh, you yes. see, I don't mind. That's all. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, this business of feeling at home in the world, I get the feeling with you that when you are working on a project, particularly with a group of actors, yes. you are very happy, or if not always happy because of stress, but something is no, happening. No, no stress. It's okay, no. but you are involved, you've become... Are you still Jonathan Miller? I'm still who, exactly who I am. Um, I, am the, I am the person that I am, and w the, whatever virtue I have in that particular uh, role um, is one of expressing interest in uh, sh making sure that the performers actually, while pretending to be who they are, pretend to the point where in fact people still find it um, that briefly or perhaps in, in quite a, a, a lengthy uh, a space of time actually feel they're in the presence of the person who, is, who the actor is pretending to be. But what I try to do as a director is to get people in the act of pretending to be someone to actually do it by uh, addressing themselves to the details of what it is to be actually someone. Hmm. In other words, negligible details. My mother, who was, a, I think, rather an impressive novelist, when I once um, spoke to her about what I was doing when I went into the theatre, um, and she said, well, you must try and do what I have done, she said, uh, in, in uh, uh, fiction, is that I, I hope that you will address yourself to trying to make the negligible considerable. In other words, to attend to the minute details of human behavior and to abstain from the, what we would call the behavioral cliches, which so often, as it were, jeopardize and compromise the reality of what is being seen on the stage. I voted, uh, to some extent, I was very much under the influence in that respect, apart from what my mother said to me, by what I'd learned when I was a doctor. Um, you, uh, when, when you're training uh, uh, in, in diagnosis, you pay attention to often overlooked and negligible details of what people do or can't do, from which you then, after a after, while, well, obviously you examine them and you may have to do x-rays and so on, more expert activities. But nevertheless, a lot of what you do as a doctor is by paying very great attention to what the person with whom you're working is saying about themselves and also what they are looking like when talking about themselves, which you, you, I, mean, I don't know whether you've noticed this. Um, who is that man? I keep on forgetting their names. Um, that man who just had a stroke and has now gone back. Andrew on. Marr. Andrew Marr. Um, um, unless you actually knew about it, you might not notice the fact that when he talks now, he the, instead of having bimanual movements which accompany speech, he in fact is only moving one hand and the other hand is lightly placed across his knee. Well, those sort of little details are what in fact you're doing when you're being a diagnostician. And it's actually sort it's, it, that is all you're doing when you're trying to be a director. You're simply um, drawing attention on the part of your cast to what they know anyway and had forgotten and get them, getting them perhaps to forget what they ought never to have known in the first place. Now always cliches. Yes. But um, that's probably why you're so uh, in accord with Chekhov and why you like directing him. There's a doctor writing. You're a doctor directing. Yes, well, I think that Chekhov obviously did have some sort of attention to that, but I think it was just that he was interested in the, in the negligible details of ordinary, ordinary pe utterly forgettable people. I mean, so many of the people about whom he wrote talk about the fact that they will, in, a, in less than 50 years, be completely forgotten. Hmm. Um, and actually, what in fact almost all interesting fiction does is that it makes the 
the negligible considerable, and it makes the forgettable memorable. And that's really what you try to do on What the you do when you move into a grander realm like King Lear or Grand Opera? Nothing grand about King Lear at all. It's a, a story about a dysfunctional family, that's all, who happens to be a monarch. Um, and in fact, it's when people start tending to the fact that he is a monarch, he's the king of England, um, that they um, overstress both poetical diction and also grandiose behavior on the stage. And in fact, the, the more you, I, I've done, I must have done King Lear now nearly, f nearly four times. In, in more, different, I think. In different Michael fashion. Horton three times. Michael Horton three times, and then, uh, oh, and then uh, uh, Chris Plummer, and then someone else as well down at the Old Vic. And, and then just recently, I've just done a, 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 a sort of staged reading by uh, uh, older actors uh, uh, as a charity. But uh, in every one of, of Lear's that I've ever done, it has always been attending to these negligible details and getting rid of the cliches. For example, the fool who's always played because he's constantly referred to as boy. People have always, have always mad him played as a boy. And he's no more a boy than black servants in the southern uh, United States are all endlessly referred to as boy. I want my tea, boy. And boy does not refer to someone of that age. It refers to someone who is, in fact, below you in social class. And I've always had the fool played as exactly the same age as Leah himself. So that these two old men who differ from one another simply by virtue of the fact that one is a monarch and the other one simply happens to be an old person who has no prestige of all sorts. And yet he has the capacity under the title of fool to say to the king, thou art a fool, and also talking like that, you know, you know, oh, I don't know why you're like that, you're a fool, you give yourself, you know, you're giving your land to your daughters, <laughs> and you can't control them, can you? What about the tragic Isn't fall, the, the, tra the tragic fall though, Jonathan, if, you, if the king starts as a, fo a foolish old man at the beginning, yes. then you're not moved by his collapse, are well, you? No, you should, be, you should be moved by everything that he does, all the way from the very beginning at the end, the right of the very beginning, you should say, this, what's this idiotic man doing asking his children how much they love him and actually negotiating with them uh, uh, for the amount and the eloquence with which they say how much they love him uh, in exchange for large parts of his territory. Um, well, I mean, he's idiotic right from the very beginning. And when he then comes to his, uh, his younger uh, daughter, Cordelia, and says, what have you to say? Nothing. What, you know, to speak again, nothing will come of nothing, he says. Very interesting phrase that. I didn't realize and pay much attention to it until about uh, two years ago. <laughs> that phrase, nothing will come of nothing, is actually repeated again and again for the previous thousand years. And it's one of the phrases which is used in order to question the, uh, the reality of the creation. That there cannot be a creation because nothing will come of nothing. That that God could not have said, "Let there be." Oh, I don't know. You know, God grumbling in the darkness, saying, "Let there be." Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let, let there be light, whatever that is. Uh, and then a voice comes saying, "No problem." <laughs> <laughs> and then I've always thought, if there was, was someone saying this, you know, trying to make something out of nothing. Um, then the more another voice would say, Lord, I know it's not in my position to say this, but is there any point having uh, light if there's um, nothing there to illuminate? <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right, uh, as you were. Uh, uh, let there be, um, oh, I don't know, uh, let there be giraffes, and now let there be light. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Actually, yes. <laughs> actually, in the, in the, mystery, the mystery plays, yes. the creation is done a bit like that. Yes, well, I've seen God sort of Mm, what yes. next? That's right. Yeah. Well, that's because the whole thing is so fatuous. It's, it comes from a curious a human egocentricity that because we're surrounded with artifacts of our own making, we assume that nature itself must have been, um, is the result of something better than us, cleverer and more, uh, you know, uh, ingenious than us, who um, says, let there be, instead of uh, let there be uh, emails, um, who says, let there be light. Um, and it's, it, it comes from something which I find absurd about the whole notion of God. That, that they, I when, when you're directing, you never feel like God. 
something? No, I just feel like someone who is in fact um, a carrier of mementos. I, I feel that my function is to remind people of the, these tiny negligible details which characterize human behavior. For example, another philosopher who had a great effect on me, he lived very near here, just down the road in fact, Brian O'Shaughnessy, an Australian philosopher who in his two-volume book on the will talks about what he calls sub-intentional actions, those things which are not like, say, sweating and uh, uh, and shivering and so forth, over which you can't exercise control. They simply happen. They're events rather than actions. But there are things that people are doing. I mean, I know people are doing it right now. I haven't told you it. <laughs> but uh, well, while you're talking, you're endlessly doing things like playing with your earlobe and things like that, or something like that. Uh, and one of the things you have to keep putting back into is the behavioral rubbish. <laughs> which actually characterize someone who's doing something at this particular moment. He's in... <laughs> <laughs> well, put your hands on your lap. But these, these sub-intentional movements are the sort of thing to which I address my uh, cast's attention. Mm -hmm. And they will then uh, say, you're quite right. I mean, for example, I, I'll give you a, just a brief example. I went doing an opera many years ago in uh, New York. I was doing The Marriage of Figaro, and where the Contessa in the third act is mourning or complaining and thinking out loud about how bad her marriage has been. And she always, when I mean, she said to me, where do I stand to do this aria? And I said, well, you can't possibly stand. You're in a state of depression. You sit down. I don't want to compromise your diaphragm or so, but I want you, you should just sit down. Can, can you sing by sitting down? She said, of course I can. And she said, what, what do I do with my hands? And I said, well, that's a very odd question. You don't ring up in the morning at 7 o'clock to hand center and say, uh, what, what am I going to do with my hands? And then someone said, that's a good question. Where will you be at 9.30 this morning? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, the hands take care of themselves. And then I said, well, if you're going to do it, indulge in these things that I've talked about, these sub-intentional actions. Stare sightlessly into the middle distance, seeing nothing while you're mourning about this ghastly, failing marriage of yours. And then just, with your hand, just run your fingers idly along the edge of the chair in which you're sitting. Scarcely notice it. And then just go on singing that aria. And she said to me, it's the first time I've been able to do that aria sensibly. What again, about, the, it, it's so detailed, that action, that you're perhaps in a huge opera house, La Scala or something. Yes, they can is see it, it picked up? Yes, of course it is. I mean, the thing is that we are extremely sensitive to each other's smallest movements, and even when they're at a distance, um, you, as long as they project to be heard, Nevertheless, these little tiny movements are what usually makes people coming out of the theatre at a production of that sort and say, yeah, it just seems, somehow seems so much more natural than one usually sees. And that even when you were sitting up at the back in the upper circle, and you looked down, you saw someone just going like that while they were thinking. And you, we, can, we can detect when someone is staring sightlessly into the middle distance and at the same time just doing that or playing with the lobe of their ear while thinking. They do see, you, you can see that. We are... We are very observant of each other's negligible behaviour, as well as of the more noticeable things we do. And, and there is this man who interests you, Irving Goffman, is that yes. right? Re sort of remedial gesture, how would you describe it? Well, among the many things that Goffman uh, addressed himself to was what he called um, uh, apologetic or remedial behaviour, behaviour which you engage in when you have reason to believe or you suspect that you might have offended or... Uh, done something which has um, made someone feel ill at ease um, and uh, you, you apologize yeah. uh, you know, oh sorry um, I mean you can see little tiny gestures and he draws he drew, draws one's attention to these minuscule gestures which are often non-verbal I mean we, he mentions this once or he said um, have you ever noticed how often someone in a crowded street trips on the pavement um, he may have been walking on his own, and nevertheless he is aware of the fact, as we all are, that we are in the presence of potential spectators all round us, watching us trip. And very often you will find someone ostentatiously going back and inspecting the pavement, <laughs> not because they're interested in the pavement, but in order to, as it were, if not to apologise, but to adjust possibly um, a critical opinion of you as being a clumsy dolt. <laughs> um, the world of opera, Jonathan, which wasn't your 
first home, really. You, no. I think you say you sidled into it. Well, I got asked to do it um, unexpectedly. I mean, for many years, all the things that happened to me were unsolicited invitations. I never intended to do any of them. I just got into them because people asked me whether I was doing them, and I was too weak to resist the invitation. But you're not sorry? Well, I am in some ways, because I actually feel that um, what I was trained to do, what my... Uh, ambition was when I was first uh, studying biology and uh, was to train to become a, a, a neurologist and then a, neuro, a neuropsychologist and just look at what the nature of action was and what the nature of perception was and what it was that made the difference between something that we do and something that merely happens to us. But I think you put on stage and film and television for all of us here in this room and many others questions about the nature of action, the nature of perception, isn't that rather marvellous? Well, that's what ought to happen all the time. That's mm -hmm. why we go to the theatre. I mean, there are people, I, I keep on saying this, and uh, I apologise if you've ever heard me say it before, but um, there are people who say, I go to the theatre to be taken out of myself. And this is usually said by people who have absolutely nothing to take out. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that the function of theatre, as indeed the function of art, is to be taken into yourself, to reacquaint yourself with things that you had previously not noticed about us, or in the case of pictures, aspects of the appearance of things which you had previously not noticed. You see, for example, when someone like Cezanne, as, the, as the, a, a person who was the antecedent in way of cubism, actually drew people's attention to aspects of uh, what things looked like by tilting things up so that, for example, tables which might be seen in that thing, he would actually tilt the table so that the things were, in fact, at an angle. Well, that enabled people to see things which they had previously not noticed about the arrangement of things. And that's all that you're doing in the arts. Most of the arts, the stuff, the stuff that I do now, which is on show at the Cross Street Gallery, are almost entirely abstract, but never abstract though they are, I hope that what they do is to draw the attention of a spectator to aspects of appearance which had not previously been noticeable. Do you think, as you get older, that everything is connected? Well, I think there is some way. It, it, it is, a, it, it is a, a plurality, a complicated overlapping Venn diagram of overlapping things of similarities and relevances and interactions and interrelationships so that the, the distinction between the arts on the one hand and the sciences on the other is, I think, slightly spurious. I mean, that if you're interested in pictures, the chances are, if you are intelligently interested in pictures, um, you're also interested in the nature of appearance. What, it is, what is it for something to be an appearance? What is the experience of seeing something which you know to be a picture rather than something actual? And what is the difference between seeing the paint? I mean, for example, Richard Walheim, who was one of my teachers and a friend of mine at uh, University College, talks about seeing, um, seeing the apples in the paint. Uh, something which Gombrich objected to. He said, what you do is you see painted apples. Well, God, uh, Walheim said, no, when you're constantly oscillating backwards and forwards between the, the paint out of which these painted apples are made, and you are constantly seeing sometimes what they are of, but sometimes what they are made of in the picture, which is different from what they are meant to be when, when you see them as apples distributed spatially beyond the frame of the picture. Should you become the apple? No, not at all. But what you are doing is you are acquainting yourself with the nature of appearance. And that's what a lot of what the, the arts are to do with. It's to do with, um, uh, as it were, not just reminding you, but, uh, but d uh, redirecting your attention towards aspects of the feel, the look, the sound of things which previously you had not noticed. And that's, I think, what, that's what I saw. It's, it's, it's being taken into yourself rather than taken out of yourself. It's to reacquaint yourself with how complicated the experience of seeing and of hearing and of feeling actually is. 
But you've several times, haven't you, run into what you call the Jurassic Park type of opera singer? Yes. Uh, who really won't budge. They well, yes, they're, 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 they're obstinate uh, fossils who are actually have standardised what they do and they, you cast them, they say, I want you to do this, and they say, no, no, Jonathan, and I don't think Alfredo would do that. And you say, well, when did you last talk to him about what he would do? <laughs> you don't seem acquainted with the fact, once again, that they are, in fact, fictional pretended characters and that there are many ways of pretending to be Alfredo one of which is the one I'm recommending to you now <laughs> uh, which doesn't preclude the possibility that you might once have done it brother in no no I know exactly who he was and then you say how did you know who he was because I've done him many times are they always Italians by the way um, <laughs> no they are not but a lot of them are Italians